out whether the books only told half the story or if there wasn't another side to your life. And maybe I could find out whether as a little insignificant pastor here in South Africa that I was just uh, some unusual kind of being and going through such problems and tests and failures. I stayed there for an hour talking to that man right out of my heart, just pouring my heart out to him and telling him some of the battles, some of the problems, and some of the gross failures in my life in the past ten years. And I noticed the longer I went, he folded his hands and the smile got broader and broader. And he, when I was all finished, he said, well, what do you know? He, he said, my problems seem so little now and insignificant. He said, in fact, my failures don't seem so bad now after what I've heard you confess here today about your great problems in your life and the battles that you fought and the enemy that's plagued you and, and every victory that you've had, you've had to fight it through by faith. And he was greatly encouraged. The truth of the matter is, my Christian friend, that Bible biographies are much closer to the truth than contemporary biographies about men that God is using today. I've read through the life stories of Jacob and David and Jonah, these men who ran these adulterers, and I read these stories and I'm shocked and I'm embarrassed and I blush and I say, God, how could you have ever used him? How could you have ever used such men? And the Bible doesn't gloss over it. The Bible doesn't whitewash it. You can read it. It's all there in black and white. It's in your Bible. And yet these men rose out of their failure and were men of the Spirit. Let's take a deep, long look at the glaring failures in the lives that men, that, in the lives of men that God has used. Would you consider Moses a failure? Hardly. Let's take a look at this man as he waves a rod and plagues an entire nation. See him stand over the sea and divide it asunder. See the armies, his armies pass over in dry land and the armies of Pharaoh smothered. Look at his face as it is alive with the glory of God as he comes from his presence. Lit up with the glory of God as no other man on earth. See a nation, an entire nation at his knees, seeking his judgment and his advice and leadership. Here's the man who talked face to face with the Almighty, who brought water, water from a rock, who made bitter water sweet. You would hardly call this great man a failure, would you? Not until you go behind the scene, behind the glory, deep into his personal life, and then all you can find, friend, when you look real close, is failure upon failure. How would you like to begin your ministry with the murder, for example? How would you like to find a clear clarion call of God, soured by 40 years alone in a desert, hiding from the courts of justice? And remember, the courts of justice would demand that he come before them. This man had murdered an Egyptian. How would you ever believe that a man of so many weaknesses could ever be used of God? After all, this man at one time was full of fear and unbelief. Ex Exodus, the fourth chapter, and the tenth to thirteenth verses, gives us four excuses this man of God used when God called him. He said, I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of speech. He said, send somebody else. Who is this talking now? Here's the man of God. Here is Moses, the leader of a nation. Here's the man who angered the Lord. In fact, this is the only place I can find in the Bible that so great a man of God, it was said of him, an indictment that he angered the Lord. Exodus 4, 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against, and God names him, against Moses. You think of the children of Israel murmuring, but don't forget that Moses murmured long before the children of Israel murmured when he said in Exodus 5.22, and Moses returned to the Lord and said, why have you treated the people so evil? 
Why did you send me? Thou hast not delivered thy people at all. This man had a temper tantrum at times. In fact, it was his angry outburst at the smiting of the rock that so angered God that God refused to allow him to enter the promised land. This was a man of a temper. This was a man who murmured. This is a man who angered God, a man full of unbelief, a man full of excuses. But in spite of these failures, of him the Bible declares, and I don't think any of us can really sound the depth of the scripture that I'm going to give you now. And Moses, verily, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. God makes it clear the day would come that the testimony of Moses' life would be faithfulness. There you have it. This is God speaking of a failure. Consider with me Jacob, the man who was numbered among the greatest. For of him the Bible says, we serve the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Now who was this man, Jacob? Was he not the prayer warrior, the intercessor who prevailed with God? Was not Jacob the man who had visions of angels ascending and descending, and the man who so recognized the presence of God that he said, Surely God is in this place. Was he not the man who said, and I quote him, God spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. Jacob was trying to tell the world, God talks to me personally. The man, Jacob, was the one who carried with him the blessing of his father Abraham to be the father of many nations. Yes, this was Jacob. Hardly a failure by our standards of success today. But Jacob was more than that. He was a man of many failures, and God never did seek to hide them. They're all there, and they're glaring failures. See him kneel, first of all, before a blind father. A blind father in an act of deception that mimics anything in the whole world. See him steal a birthright and a blessing in this act of deception. Here's the man who married Leah, but was in love with Rachel. And while married to Leah, it is said, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed but to him a few days for the love that he had unto her. This is speaking of another woman. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for his wife Leah? The scripture said, and he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and the Lord saw that Leah was hated. In fact, God opened this hated woman's womb to assist her in winning the love and the attention of Jacob, a man who did not recognize his responsibility as a husband. Now, no matter what it may be said of the day and the time, and no matter how we may wink at the constitution of men in that time, there is no rationale for his action. There is no rationale in any generation for any man acting as Jacob did. Jacob, in fact, was a failure as a husband to Leah. She kept saying to herself after each birth of a man-child, Now surely this time will my husband be joined unto me. This man was a failure in his home. Here's the story of a man caught in deception and graft and unfaithfulness and polygamy, thievery and craftiness. Yet it is still said, We serve the God of Abraham of Isaac and of Jacob. The Bible does not hide it. Now, consider David the patriarch. Was this not the man of God who would not even stand with sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful? Isn't he the man who delighted in the law of the Lord, who asked the heathen for heritage, who preached righteousness to the whole congregation, who served the Lord with fear and trembling, who led the armies of Israel from victory to victory? Was David not the giant killer? 
the man who evoked the respect of thousands who sang his praises and talked of his exploits, was this not the king who was promised that his seed should reign forever? Was it not said that Jesus was the son of David, not the son of Abraham, the son of David, Jesus, the son of David? Would you consider David a failure? The Bible does not gloss over this man's failure, and they were shocking by any standard. Here was the man who sent Job into battle with all of the armies of Israel while he sunned himself on the rooftop in Jerusalem. And according to Nathan the prophet, he despised the commandments of the Lord. Yes, the man who said, the law of God is my delight. Nathan said, you despised it. The Nathan, the prophet, pointed a finger at him and said, Thou art the man, wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah. And in essence, he said, You're a murderer, David. You've had Uriah the Hittite slain at the, by the sword of the children of Amnon. You've taken his wife. Thou hast despised me. And thou didst it secretly. And because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And friends, if you want to see how shocking it is, if you want to see how world-shaking it is, just picture this great man of God, the king of a mighty nation, standing at the casket of a dead, illegitimate child, standing hand in hand with a stolen wife. The enemies of God around the world laughing and blaspheming this man who wrote such beautiful music and out of whose lips and heart poured such praises to Almighty God. He stands at the cask of an illegitimate dead son. A failure. By any standard, by any stretch of the imagination, David was a failure. Nevertheless, of David, the Bible says, Jesus, the son of David, and also the Lord saw him, a man after his own heart, to be captain over his people, David. Now, how can God use the murderous Moses, the scheming Jacob, the commandment-breaking adulterous David? How can God use these men? I want you to know, friends, when you look very close into their lives, you'll find that these men learned to face their failures. They didn't run from them. They didn't hide them. They didn't gloat in them. But they learned how to live above them. They learned how to face it and bring glory to the name of God. I remember last night a woman coming to me, confessing, Mr. Wilkerson. She was real heartbroken. I've been going to Christian Center Church. I was an alcoholic. The Lord saved me and filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I hadn't touched drink in many weeks and months. But she said, lately I've been discouraged. The enemy has come in like a lion. And lately, I'm sorry to say, I've been drinking. And she was heartbroken. And she said, I, I, I've just failed God so much, there's nothing else for me to do. I just feel I've got to quit. Same night, last night, standing against the wall, to the left of the auditorium, was a sailor. And when I went to him to pray with him and talk to him, he said, just leave me alone, Mr. Wilkerson. There's no use spending any time with me. It won't work. I used to go to a Pentecostal church before I went to the Navy. I've known the Lord, and I love him. And I don't want to run from him, but I just can't live for him because I'm too weak and I've failed God over and over again and there's just no use. You can't do anything for me. You can't help me. Just leave me alone. There are thousands of people like this around the world today facing a terrible dilemma. And I suppose years ago before God began to deal with me on this, I would have called them outright rank sinners. But I don't think that's the case. I believe there are Christians that attend our church, or other parishioners who come to our churches on Sunday night and attend our evangelistic services. And it's not that they despise the Lord. I believe there are many that pray at night and, and, and are still in their way seeking after God. 
But they say, I can't live it. I don't have the power. I've been such a failure. There's just no use trying. Like one said to me the other day, I would serve the Lord, but I'm too weak. I just keep falling and failing and going back. So I don't even try to be a Christian now. And if you're facing that kind of a battle, and this is your confession, I'd like to say to you that you're closer to the kingdom of God than the man or the woman who tries to hide their sin and act like an angel and never admit their need or their failure. You're closer to the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell you how I believe that you can face your failures and become a man or woman of God in spite of them. Young people, mark this on the eyelets of your forehead. Mark it deep in your mind indelibly and never forget them. Now, these are principles of the Holy Ghost. God gave this to me in prayer. First of all, if you're going to face your failures, you've got to do this. Shake off all your fears about failure. Never be afraid of failure. Fear of failure always causes a person to hide themselves from the presence of God. It causes a person to run. Adam, after he sinned, in essence said, I have failed God, so I was afraid, so I hid myself. I failed, so I hid myself because I was afraid. Peter failed his master, and what a tragic failure. What a tragic thing to see this man fall on his face and grovel as he did. And in his fear, he ran. He had to get away from the searching eye of his master. Peter ran in fear of his failure. Jonah knew that he'd failed in his mission and his call to go to Nineveh, and he drove himself rather in fear to Tarsus, the Bible says, to flee from the presence of the Lord. Look at this, Adam running in fear, Peter running in fear, Jonah running in fear, away from the presence of God because they had a fear of their failure. Now, God has been showing me a truth, and if you'll get a hold of this truth, it'll change your life. The devil uses the fear of failure to get you to forsake the Lord and to run in self-disgust, saying to yourself, I'm not worthy. You know, I'm afraid that hell's going to be full of people who just gave up and ran in fear and said, I'll never make it. God is too holy. God is too perfect, and I can never live up to his perfection. I can never please the Lord, and so we run in fear. Now, why do you think Adam and Peter and Jonah ran from the presence of the Lord? Do you think for one moment that Peter lost his love for Christ? Never did Peter lose his love for Christ. I believe as he stood on that hillside weeping over his failure that he loved Christ more than he ever loved him in his life. You think for one minute that Adam hiding himself in the presence of God had suddenly become a backslider and turned his back on God and said, I just don't want to be around him anymore. Not at all. I think it grieved him. I believe it hurt him more than anything that ever happened in his life. I believe he still loved God. I believe Jonah as he ran kept telling himself, I'm just not worthy. I failed God. I ran, so I might as well keep on running. Satan waits. He tarries like a vulture around your personality. Then he uses every lie of hell when you fall and fail. And he tries to tell you to run, to give up, that God is too holy, that you're too unclean, that you're too unperfect, and that you'll never make it. I want to tell you, friends, that every man that I've mentioned tonight fled in the face of their failure. They didn't learn their lesson. The Bible said, and Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And this is the same thing we all say. Surely everybody knows about the failure in my life. When in reality, the scripture said, there's nothing befalling you but such is common to all men. And God knows about it. He said, don't think it's strange concerning the fire trial which has come to try you. 
as if some strange thing has happened to you and the whole world knows it. Now the Bible does say, be sure your sin will find you out. But don't think for one moment that the failure that you face is unique and that nobody else has ever faced it. And you're the only one who has failed in this particular way. God forbid that you should think that. Moses fled, the Bible says, and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. That man that you see sitting by that well is a picture, a perfect picture of failure. Here's the man who's telling himself, it's all over, I'm all washed up. I thought God called me, and I end up murdering an Egyptian. Now I have to flee from the court of justice. And that man sat there thinking that his ministry was over. I'm a failure, I'm washed up, I've had it. There's no more opportunity. And if this man would have believed that lie, you'd have never heard another word about him. In fact, it took 40 years for God to drive that fear of failure out of his heart. I've never believed that it was 40 years just learning lessons in the wilderness. I've never believed that God was waiting 40 years for the Israelis or the Israelites to get ready to leave. I believe it was God's program, and if, if Moses would have come face to face with his failure and learned to overcome it, God would have moved. And I believe the program of God was delayed 40 years for a, a man, one man, to play around with his fear of failure and to bring himself to the place where he would believe God in spite of his failure. David, in fear after his sin, cries out, Oh, that I had the wings, that I could escape to the desert. I would escape from the fiery blast. But then he goes on to say, but where shall I flee from his presence? Where shall I hide from his spirit? There's no place to hide. Jacob flees into the desert, trying to escape his deed and his failure. Nothing but a pillow for a stone, but God brings him to his penile. If any one of these men had resigned to failure, you would have never heard a word from them again. But you see Moses rising again to go to Egypt, forgetting his hour of failure, the rod of God in his hand. You see Jacob returning to be reunited with his brother, having prevailed with the Lord and forgetting his past. You see David running into the house of God, laying hold on the horns of the altar to return a mighty man of faith. You see Jonah retracing his steps. You see him going to Nineveh, forgetting his hour of fear and failure and preaching in faith. You see Peter going to Pentecost, and forgetting that courtroom experience, becoming a man of victory and power in the upper room. Secondly, in spite of all failures, keep moving on. Did you hear me? Keep moving on. There's a lady who met me right back in the church tonight. She said, Rose, I want to stay here at the second time just to hear that part of it, to keep moving on. It's always after failure that a man does his greatest work for God. I repeat it, it is always after failure and a man facing his failure that a man does his greatest work for God. I sat in my car ten years ago, weeping like a baby. I just had been kicked out of the courtroom. I turned to Miles. I was leaning out the window, just sobbing out my heart. And I said, Miles, I'm a failure. I thought God called me to talk to those boys, and I went up kicked out. I said, did you see how those cops handled me? They treated me like a maniac. I said, how do I face my dad, mom? How do I face my wife? What's my church going to think now? I told them I was going to New York and I was, God was going to open the door. I was going to talk to those boys. I said, I'm walking home as a failure and I was ashamed to leave that city. I made that boy drive around that city for three hours trying to get courage to go over the Brooklyn or over the George Washington Bridge to head back to Pennsylvania. And I'll tell you, that was like going to the electric chair for me. I was ashamed to go home. I had to go to my dad in Scranton, Pennsylvania and walk in the door without saying a word. He had the daily news laid out there. He'd seen and heard the story already. And I said, Dad, I don't have anything to say. I thought God had called me. 
And I thought that was the end of my ministry and my call. You could have told me then that that failure, what appeared to be a failure, was just the seed of a blessing of God, that God was just using that to open the door, that God was going to turn that apparent failure into glorious victory and raise up a testimony to the whole world. You couldn't have told me then because I was a failure. But friends, I want you to know that if God hadn't spoken to my heart to go back the next week and keep moving on, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. The cross and switchblade story would have never been a testimony to the glory of God. And hundreds of young people, especially drug addicts, would still be dying and going to hell. God said, go on. And I'm thinking tonight of two outstanding ministers, 15 18 years ago, both of them ministering to thousands. They were both respected. They were household words. Everybody knew these names. Both of these men fell into the sin that David committed, the act of adultery. One of these men decided that it had so shaken him that he couldn't go on. In fact, he lost his faith, began to curse and drink and smoke. You'll find him in Canada today, an editor of a newspaper, this man gave up. He refused to go on. The other gentleman, who was popular in that same day and fell almost the same time, came out of the ashes of his failure and despair, repented and cried out to God for a ministry. And God has restored that man with dignity and respect. He's on a coast-to-coast -coast network of missions program that's reaching the whole world. That man today has respect of thousands. Because he went on, David kept moving on after his sin, after the funeral, the boy's body is committed to the ground. And this is the very next statement in the Bible concerning David's life. But it says this, 2 Samuel 13, 24, and David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son and called his name Solomon. And here's the part that I like. And the Lord loved him. And the Lord loved him. All oh, the great mercy of God extended to a man who in spite of his failure rises out of it repentance and says, Oh God, I'm going on. And out of the ashes of his failure, David rises, picks up his army again and goes out after the Ammonites. The scripture says, after the battle, they took the king's crown from off his head. And it was set upon David's head, and he brought forth spoil in great abundance. Look at this man now standing again with dignity at the throne. And God in his mercy blessing Bathsheba, giving Solomon a son, out of whose womb came Christ. And this I cannot understand. It's the mercy of God beyond any finite comprehension. How God can bless a man in spite of his failure. You couldn't figure that out if you tried. Look at Moses going on after a life of failure and fear in 40 years, alone and abandoned. Here he stands now at the Red Sea in his finest hour. Here he comes now to do his greatest work of God after his story of failure. The chapter of failure is closed, and here we read of him. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, and stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. The Lord shall fight for you. He shall hold your peace. Think of it. This man stands with power and dignity in his finest hour after his hour of failure. Don't give up just because you failed. Your greatest hour is yet to come. I remember sending our first two converts, Nicky Cruz and Angelo Morelli's. Angelo was the boy who met me and took me around to meet all the parents of these boys in the murder trial. I sent these two boys to La Puente Bible Institute, right here in California. Three months after I sent them to school, I got a call from the president of Bible school. He said, I'm sorry, Brother Wilson, going to have to kick him out. And that was a shock, I promise you. I couldn't believe my ears. First two converts... First two Bible school students are going to be kicked out as failures. Two dropouts from the Teen Challenge Ministry. I hung up that phone. 
I got on my knees, and I said, oh, God, out of this apparent failure, get glory. And I said, we're going to keep moving this on for God. I got on the telephone, I got a hold of Nikki Cruz and Angelo, got them on a conference call and two telephones. And I said, you still love me? Yes, sir. You still respect me? Yes, sir. You still love Jesus? Yes, sir. All right, get on your knees and put your arms around each other. Quit this fighting. Yes, sir. <laughs> Nikki's finest hour was still to come. And God raised that boy out of that ashes of failure because he just wasn't making it. And that boy became a model student, graduated with honors. Angela Morales graduated with honors to go out and face his finest hour as a Sunday school teacher and a worker in church. And Nikki Cruz to face his finest hour. Sonny Argonzoni, three days in my house kicking drugs. His father and mother, Pentecostal people praying for him. And I thought, here's a great victory. And I drove with him into Brooklyn singing the praises of God. Parked the automobile, five minutes only into Brooklyn. He jumps out of the car and starts running down the street back to the needle. A failure. A failure. Not by any stretch of the imagination, Sonny was still going to face his finest hour. Tomorrow night is going to be one of those hours at White Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church as I stand for Sonny to, to present the challenge of his drug addict church here to the city of Los Angeles. He's pastor there now. That boy came up out of the ashes of failure, came back to Teen Towns because the seed had been planted. And, and Sonny can tell you about failure. He can tell you how it feels to go back to the needle. He can tell you how it is to go back to the bottle, back to the prostitute after confessing Christ as his Savior and feeling the power of the Holy Ghost in his life. And I can tell you about 90% of all my boys have fallen fat on the, flat on their face. I, I, I've seen boys that once had the touch of God, now meet them on the street, dirty, filthy, unshaven. And I said, all right, buddy, it's time to come home. You see the Spirit of God still trembling all over their bodies, and they come back and stand in the pulpit and talk about that hour when they thought that all was lost. They come back as mighty preachers of the gospel. Oh, yes, they failed God, failed God miserably. Back to the needle, back to drugs, and back to their sex life. But out of the ashes of failure, kept moving on and faced their finest hour yet. Maybe your finest hour is yet to come. You sit now in the midst of failure. I say keep moving on. Third, in spite of all your failure, keep going back to the altar. Keep worshiping the Lord. Moses, in spite of the fact that he failed, said, He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. There was only one way that Moses kept the victory in his life. I believe Moses could have been a man of tragic failure all through his life because he had that kind of personality that's evidence in the making of this man of God that he had failure written all over his personality. But I'll tell you what Moses' salvation was. He learned to talk to God as a friend. He learned to have it out with the Lord. The scripture says of him in Exodus 33, 9 and 10, this is a beautiful verse. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door. The Lord talked with Moses. The Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Oh, I like that. That's how he kept his victory. He wasn't any better. The only reason God brought this man through, he talked to him as a man talks to his friend. Now there you have it, my friend, in spite of your failure, going back to God as friend to friend and say, Lord, you're still my friend. I still love you. I failed you, oh God, but I love you. This was the secret of David's victory, and this is why God called a man after his own heart, in spite of the fact that he'd murdered, in spite of the fact that he was had stolen his wife and lived in adultery, in spite of all the blaring, sinful deeds of this man's life, David wrote these words. My favorite, 
songs. If, if anybody has my autograph in one of my books, underneath my name is my favorite chapter, the chapter David wrote after he came through this stage of failure. It's the 25th chapter. And this has been the motto of my life ever since God called me into the Teen Challenge ministry. I read this every day. I, it's a part of my personality now. The 25th chapter. Here is what David said. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. David started waiting on the Lord. He went back to the house of God. He went back to the horns on the altar and said, God, forget my foolishness of my youth and my transgressions, and let me not be ashamed because I wait on you. Show me thy ways. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in truth. Teach me. Thou art my God. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies, thy loving kindnesses. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Good and upright is the Lord. He will teach sinners in the way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. What man is he? And here's my favorite verses from 12 to 15. I have them marked. God gave me this one night in prayer when he called me into the teen challenge. What man, in fact, God told me this would be the theme of my ministry. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. David went into the house of God and he admitted his failure. He said, I acknowledged my sin. And he said, then I cried out, oh God, pluck my feet out of the net now. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. In other words, those who keep coming back to him with fear and respect and worship. This is the man that understands my secret. The secret of how I can use a man in spite of his failure. Here's the secret right here. Now let's talk about your failure before I close. Is there trouble in your home or your personal life? Maybe a habit that you despise but you can't break. A friendship that can't seem to be broken though you know it's wrong. Or torment in your mind, anxiety and fear, evil thoughts. Or bondage by things like tobacco or drink. What's the solution? How? How? Brother Wilkerson? How can I turn my failure into victory? How can I look at it and face it? All right. I believe it comes to worship. A lady stopped me just outside here, just before the service. She said, Brother Wilkerson, please, would you expand just a moment? I'm, I, I'm in the middle of a great failure in my life. What do I do right now? Before I get in my car and go home, what do I do? I said, get your hands up. She raised her hands. I said, now in spite of your failure, praise you. He said, he that cometh to me, keep coming back. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden. In other words, come all you failures. Bring them to me. I'll give you rest. Now, what did I say to them? Young man, young woman, dad, mother, what did I really say? I said to face your failure, don't be afraid of it, keep going on in spite of it, and worship, worship, exalt his name in the middle of it, by your heads. Jesus, you've never told me to preach just to be heard. You've never let me make a fool of myself. You've never let me waste words. And I believe you gave me your mind tonight. I believe you told me to come here and preach this tonight because you knew there'd be somebody here tonight that was facing the biggest failure battle in their life. 
and you want to give them victory. You're trying to say this failure is just the open door to a great life of faithfulness and victory. The Lord will not condemn tonight. You said your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. And I believe that there are some here tonight, Lord, that just felt they can't walk with you, they can't go on anymore because they can't get the victory, they can't live in victory. Forgive, Lord. Forgive and undertake. Let us show mercy as you have shown mercy. And let us help to heal and bind the broken hearts. Heal the wounds. Oh, God, I pray for those tonight who must in all honesty look into their hearts and say, Lord, I've failed you. I've failed you. Oh, God. God's grief over his people. Heavenly Father, I want you to speak to us this morning. I want you to talk to me. I want you to talk to all of us about your grief over us. Hallelujah. Amen. Before I start, uh, when I was... Uh, at Swaggart Sunday night, uh, a group called the Singing Rambos did the music. Uh, Reba Rambo and her husband. And uh, we went out to eat after. And they began to testify how their life had been so changed last week by a miracle. They have a lady friend in California who is dying of cancer, terminal cancer. And it's her third operation. She's lost her hair three times. And she's terminal, and she prayed, Lord, before I die, I want to see you. I want you to come to my room. I want you to talk to me. I want you to meet me. And the Lord, through prayer, appeared to her. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared in her room, and her hands were so cold, and he was just massaging her hand and said, Dearest, come with me, and took her on a four-hour journey over green pastures and over still waters as far as the eye could see, and then sat beside a still water, from green pastures and began to unburden his heart to her. Her name was Lucy, and he said, Lucy, I'm a bridegroom, and the reason I want a bride is because I need love. I need to be loved just as sure as you need to be loved. And he, with tears in his eyes, he said, I'm wearied of my bride. I'm wearied of my bride. My bride is careless. My bride doesn't love me anymore. They talk about loving me, but my bride doesn't love me anymore. And I'll tell you, she, uh, the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm going to give you a little more time, and I'm going to linger in your room with my presence and touch everybody who comes in your room to hear this message, and their life will be changed, and I want this message to spread. Your pastor and everyone who comes in the room, and the glow of the Lord after seven days is still in that room. Doctors, nurses, everyone are trying to get into that room Rambo said, when we walked in that room, suddenly it was revealed to us how shallow our lives are. And we were convicted and stirred. She just lays in the bed with that glow on her face and tells everybody in the room, Jesus is weary of his bride. Get ready, get prepared, begin to love him. The pastor was moved, stood in the pulpit and told about it. And now all over Southern California, that word is spreading. And one woman who has seen Christ and in the same message, when they were saying that, that witnessed to me, all oh, that witnessed to me, Jesus says, I'm wearied of my bride. And I was praying last night, and the Lord gave me a message, God's grief over his bride, God's grief over his people. Now, you know the final outcome of the church of Jesus Christ is one of victory. You know the final outcome is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's the final outcome. There's nothing going to change that. That's final God is going to be victorious in the end. But in the meantime, remember the flood that Satan sent out against the angel and for a season prevailed against the woman in the wilderness? Now, I want to talk about that this morning. We're supposed to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed and secured by the blood. But anybody with any spiritual discernment at all know that the church of Jesus Christ is not where it should be. We all know it. And there is not a word, there's not a person here that doesn't discern it. Satan is trampling over God's people almost at will. Gwen and I read thousands of letters. Gwen reads eight and ten hours a day of letters coming from all over the United States. Some of you that are on our staff right now know what's happened. We sent out a prayer request letter, a sheet, where people could just request prayer, and 
how many, I don't know, we probably had four to five thousand just last week. And the first few days, over one hundred of them from women whose husbands, Christian husbands are leaving them. Broken homes. And Gwen and I, uh, uh, I'll be studying and I'll be in prayer and she'll say, honey, please listen to this. And she begins to pour it out. Here's a minister, somebody of God's minister. His wife has just run off with another man. Left him with two children. He's about to give up his ministry. You, you, here, here are grandparents saying, my grandchildren don't talk to me anymore. They're supposed to be Christian. Here's a letter from a pastor from New York. It says, in New Jersey, uh, a group that used to be connected with uh, a printing company, charismatic, they began to have these choreo- choreographer dances in the church. Now they've moved into ballroom dancing in the church, the sector and music, and bringing bands in. And he said, then they sing and shout and talk in tongues, and then Saturday nights are having their, their ballroom dancing. And now it's sweeping all through the East Coast. And, and you, you get letters and you read these things and you see Satan trampling over God's house at will. Just walking over his people. Walking at will. And, and you, there's, you go to prayer and there's a holy indignity comes upon you. And you say, Lord, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Children rebelling and backsliding, chaos in the homes. It was for a while just husbands leaving wives, but now wives leaving husbands. The backsliding is so widespread, it's a pandemic thing that's happening, backsliding beyond anything this nation has ever seen. All across America, there, around the world, there are probably over 350, maybe 400 teen challenge centers taking in drug addicts and alcoholics. And all of our people are on their knees seeking God because of the widespread backsliding. Many have been converts who walked through the program and now backsliding, turning their back on the Lord. And we detect in these letters a sense of helplessness. So many people giving up hope and a loss of joy and victory in their lives, a sense of being defeated and cast down, defenseless, trodden down and wearied and troubled in mind. And there's something in me that says, Lord, why is the devil wreaking such havoc among God's people? And my grief, I believe, only reflects a little bit of the grief of God over the pitiful condition of the life and the homes of God's people. God does grieve over his people. He grieved for 40 years over Israel. Listen to it. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? God was what? He was grieved. Don't tell me God doesn't grieve. He said, with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was he not grieved with them that sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. And this is the amazing thing. This is the people God promised to carry like a father carries a son in his arms. He said, I'll carry you in my arms. I'll take you through the Red Sea. I'll take you through the wilderness. And I'll plant you in a good land. He promised to be their guide, their keeper, their shelter, their strong arm. And I've just written down some of the things I've found in the Old Testament. He said, I'll be your covert from every storm. I'll be your deliverer from every enemy. I'll be your high tower of protection. He said, no weapons formed against you shall prosper. I'll keep you as the apple of my eye, the delight of my soul, the object of my tender loving care. Your enemies will be your footstool. You will be not just conqueror, but more than conqueror. And listen to this, what God is saying. I'll carry you like a father carries a son. No enemy shall prosper against you. I'll make you victorious in all things. I'll make every enemy your footstool. And had they only believed that, they would have lived a life of victory and joy, and they would have moved into a promised land and had victory all their lifetime. Had they simply believed his promises and rested in his mighty power, they would have been an invincible people. They could have walked through that perilous wilderness well-fed, without thirst, without fear or despair, with every need supplied, with a song in their heart and great joy. They could have lived a life of peace and rest and victory and moved into a land of promise. And every tear would have been wiped away. Now, that was God's plan. Why would God take a people out of the brick hills of Egypt? Why would he move them through the Red Sea? Why would he allow them to go through all this but to prepare them a good land? God never intended we live like we do. Never. That's never been God's plan. 
It's been unbelief that destroyed the whole plan of God in Israel. Unbelief blinded the eyes of the people toward the ways of God. They missed God's plan simply because they would not believe His word is true. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now it wasn't just their lust that kept them out. It wasn't just dancing around the golden calf. It wasn't because they were neighing after each other's wives. It was beyond that. You see, God was forgiving to their sins. He had a Passover lamb and our Savior was always, He's been merciful and forgiving to our sins. It wasn't just lust. It was something beyond that. It's the one thing that God sees in all of us far beyond lust, far beyond all of these petty things of the flesh. Oh, there was no problem with David finding forgiveness. Forgiveness is not the problem. It's our unbelief. It's our lack of confidence, our lack of trust in the Lord. It was this blatant unbelief that tied God's hands so he could no longer help them. He could no longer deliver Israel. Unbelief robbed them of every promise God made to them. It closed the door of fullness and joy. They began to even doubt that God loved them, that God was involved in their life. They questioned his mercy. And they began to turn inward to help themselves. And we look over, you know, I was looking over yesterday the pitiful history of Israel in this wilderness and I say to myself, and I, I stood to my feet and I was walking around. Uh, I have a room up top of my garage. And I'm walking around there in the presence of the Lord. Every time I walk in, I meet him there. And I was looking at this and I said, oh God, what a waste. What a waste. Only Joshua and Caleb and Moses. Only three remained true of that whole tribe of Israel. What it could have been if they would have simply believed God. They didn't have to live in bondage. They didn't have to live in fear and trouble. That was all self-inflicted. They could have chosen God's way. They are wasted in a wilderness, God-forsaken, because of nothing short of unbelief. God grieves even more over this generation because of our unbelief, because we have better promises than Israel had, we still believe not. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you seem to come short of it. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. And there you have it. Think for a moment of God's grief when he sees what's happening to American Christian homes in our lives. When he says, Israel didn't have an example like you have. They couldn't pick up a Bible. They couldn't pick up a testimony and learn of a people that could have had everything and backslid because of unbelief. They don't have an example. But you have an example, he says. We have an example of what happens to a people who won't believe God's word. And he said, are you going to fail after the same example of unbelief as Israel? And that's what God said to me yesterday, David, do you believe me? When you come into the presence of the Lord, then you make your petitions known. Do you believe that King Jesus at that very moment hears you? The eyes of the Lord on the righteous and his ears open to their prayer. Do you believe that God is at work that very moment? I was praying at that particular time when God was speaking that to my heart about my son and uh, pastor's uh, primarily black church in Detroit. He's about 26 years old and I, I pray from night and day because of the powers of Satan all around that wicked city and, and the physical harm and danger all around. And I prayed for him and God said, you believe that while I'm praying right now that I am at work in your boy's life and in his church that right now while you pray I've dispatched an army of angels and I'm at work. You believe it? And I said, yes I do. We have a house for sale. We used to live in a big house and we just said we can't live there anymore so we had it up for sale. It's been there for a year. And I've been praying about the Lord said, you believe I'm able to raise up a stone and turn it into a buyer? Yes. Because he can make the stones rise up and praise him. And the Lord said, if you believe I can make a stone into a buyer, I'll give you a buyer. You have to believe that. Do you believe? Do you believe his word? 
You believe when he said, ask and you shall receive. You believe he means that. Hmm. Very few of us believe it. Very few of us live it. God's saying it should be different now. You've got my promise to bring you into a place of perfect peace and rest if you'll only believe. You've got the example here of Israel of what happened to them. <sighs> detailed. Look at it. It's all detailed. Go and read it. Read it once again and, and picture yourself and say, here, here it is. I have this example. And yet I'm doing the same stupid things they did. I'm not believing just like they didn't. God says, listen, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We have a high priest now, not like Israel. We have a high priest that's passed into the heavens. We have a high priest that's seated behind, beside the right hand of God. We have a high priest that's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And while I'm talking to you right now, he is touched with the feeling of everything you and I are going through. He's touched with it. He knows it. And he said, you have something better than they did. They had priests that died. They had priests that couldn't feel. They had priests that couldn't read their mind. You have a high priest who's ascended to the Father and he's seated at the right hand of the, of the Father. He's seated on his kingly throne. He's not only king, he's an assessor, he's high priest. And he says, come to this high priest, come to him in full confidence. Come to him to receive mercy and grace to help in your time of need. Yet we act like we have no king. We act like we've been abandoned. We go into God's presence and like beggars, we go into him like he's uh, somebody just floating around in his spirit. We've got to wake him up to get his attention. No. He says, do you believe me? Do you trust me? Why do you pray? Why do you talk to me if you don't believe that I'm going to answer? Why do you talk? Why do you worship me if you don't believe that I'm real? And so often we bind God's hands. We bind him. It was so when Jesus walked in the flesh, he went to his own country, the scripture said, among his own people, and listened to this. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, listen to that. They tied the hands of Almighty God. God couldn't work. God couldn't work in Israel because of unbelief. Jesus, the Son of God, the miracle worker, could do no mighty works in there is because of their unbelief. And we tie his hands the same way. We tie him up. You know, Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would. He kept saying, I would. I would have gathered you as a mother. Gathered you. I would, but you would not. And you hear it all through. I would, but you wouldn't. I would, but you wouldn't. I hear that all through the Bible. Every time I read it now, I'm more willing to give than you are to receive. I'll do it. I will. I'm willing. I'm willing. But you're not. Your unbelief has tied me. Your unbelief stands, hinders me from doing what I need to do. In these last days... Those who have not learned to trust the Lord in everything are going to be consumed when the troubles really begin to flow. All the Israelites who come out of Egypt except Joshua and Caleb are consumed in this terrible wilderness. Before he died, Moses told them why God was going to leave them alone. Moses predicted, he prophesied, he said, you're all going to die in this terrible wilderness. You're going to die here. You're going to die miserable lives. And then he told him why. He said, God promised to fight your battles. He bore thee in his arms as a man doth bear his son. Yet all, after all this, you did not believe the Lord your God. Let me read it to you again. This is Deuteronomy 1, 30 and 32. Listen. God promised to fight your battles. He bore you in his arms as a man doth bear his son. Yet all after all of this, you did not believe the Lord your God. And then Moses said, And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and he was angry, and he swore, saying, Surely these shall, there shall not one of this evil generation see that good land. Turn you, and take your journey back into the wilderness. Go not up, neither fight, for I'm not among you anymore. The Lord will not hearken or give ear to you anymore. Oh, that's powerful. That's frightening. God's saying to his children, go back, die in the wilderness because you don't believe me. I've tried to bear you. I've tried to walk with you. 
I made you promises and you won't believe me. And I heard your thoughts because our thoughts are words. I heard what you were thinking. I, I can tell when my wife's thinking. I said, honey, come on, get it out. I know what you're thinking. And she said, I'm not thinking anything, but if I'll just wait long enough and press in, it'll come out. And the Lord says, I know what you're thinking. And you know, we, we, we get the idea, well, well, Lord, we're just human, we're just frail, and y- you, you don't mind these feeding thoughts of doubt and unbelief, and God says, no, I heard you. I heard your words, I heard what you said in your tent. I heard what you said in your room, I heard what you said in the imagination of your heart, and I was angry by what you said, and because you've said in your heart that I'm not with you, because you questioned me, go back into your wilderness, go back! And I'm not going with you anymore. I'll not hear you anymore. Because the more I talk to you, the more I promise you, the less you love me, the less you believe me. All sense of God, beware of the language of your heart. Beware of the language of your mind. Do you really believe that when he said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him? you believe that? Do you believe that this past week when the devil came against you like a flood, that the Spirit of the Lord was right there at work, though you didn't see him, raising up a standard, his holy standard? Or were you saying, God, where are you? Why did this happen? Are you throwing him a bundle of questions? Now, it's a great evil in the eyes of the Lord to speak doubt about his love or care for you. I want you to listen to this. Isaiah, now, just, just... Look at me. Give me your good eye because I want to share something from my heart. Isaiah said, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. Now listen. Who is he talking about? Lift up your trumpet, blow the horn, show my people their transgressions. Now this this blew my mind when I saw it. I'm speaking from Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Now here, here's the here's the tragedy. He's talking to a people who love to seek God. He's not talking to prostitutes. He's not talking to alcoholics. He's not even talking to backslidden Christians. He's talking to those who are supposed to be on fire for God. Listen to it amazingly. He said, he's talking to those, and this is in Isaiah 51, 2. He's speaking to those who sought the Lord daily, who delighted to know his ways. Listen to it. He said, he's speaking to those who sought the Lord daily, who delighted to know his ways, who did righteously, who forsook not the ordinances of their God, and took delight in poaching to the Lord. They took delight in poaching to God. They delighted to go to prayer. They loved God. And yet he's saying to them, show them their transgressions. Show them their sin. And I say to myself, oh God, how do you show people sin? who are beginning to seek you with all their heart and mind and soul and strength, and they're saying, oh, God, stir me, and they delight to pray. They love God. They delight in his presence. And here's the prophet Isaiah saying, go tell them their transgressions. Show them their sins. And what is the sin? Huh? Here's the very best, the very chosen of God, and yet they're guilty of a grievous sin, and it's a sin of unbelief. You find it in the third verse. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Here are people of praying, here are people delighting in seeking the Lord, and yet when they go home, yet there's something over and above it all that's saying, maybe this doesn't pay. Where is the sign, where's the evidence of his working in my life? They're saying, and, and they're listening to the lies of the devil. The devil came in. This is why this message is so important to me because I've just experienced this. I've just gone through it. The Lord showed me my transgression. Showed me that my last idol was not television. It was nothing else but unbelief. Unbelief. It's an idol in all of us. Listen to me now. Listen good. God showed me my unbelief because during that time I was listening to these subtle little things. You know, the biggest lie the devil will tell you in that is that God's grace is so great and so mighty 
You can do almost anything and be forgiven. He'll turn the grace of God into lasciviousness right before your eyes. And I'll tell you what it did to me. For some reason or other, I picked up Luther's book on Galatians. And I'm reading there, and Martin Luther is saying, God's grace is so great that your sin is no longer sin in his eyes. And the old devil says, that's Martin Luther. And he's saying, God's grace is so great and the Lord is so forgiving that even though you sin, it's not sin in his eyes anymore. It's a lie, but it's a subtle thing. And, and suddenly the devil says, see, who are you? Who are you to live such a straight life and preach such a doctrine of holiness? Who are you? When the mighty Martin Luther, and you know, the sense is, well, just ease up. Just ease up. And that's when the unbelief begins to flood in. And say, oh, you know, others are praising the Lord. Others are being filled with the Holy Ghost and they're living, having fun. Now, that's not what I want. I don't want the fun. I've turned my back on all of that. But it's the devil coming and says, go ahead and write your book. Nobody's going to listen. They're going to make fun of you. Why make a fool out of yourself? And that's the way it's going to be for you. You, you. The devil will come to you and say, hey, you started to seek God with all your heart. You're giving him everything now. Some of you have thrown out your television set because you know it's an idol. You know it's the power of the devil's behind it now. And you're cleaning up your lives and you're seeking God. And then the enemy will come in like a flood and say it doesn't pay. What foolishness. Some of you that are working over here for last days, you work 18 hours a day. And the devil will come to you lay down so tight at night and say you're a fool, you're crazy. Go out and make money. And he'll lie to you. And that's what he's, that's, that's what these dear people were saying. Even though they delighted to come into the presence of the Lord, suddenly this thought came to them. Why am I fasting? I don't see evidence. God's not answering my prayer. Where's the evidence? God show me. I'm seeking your face night and day and I'm praying and I know I'm a man of God. I know I'm a woman of God. But where's the answer? Things are not changing. Show me the evidence. And the devil will make you demand evidence from God. He'll say, if you're a man of God, if you're a praying woman and you believe the prayer works, where's the evidence? Oh, thank God for that scripture said, blessed is he who sees not and yet believes. Hallelujah. Now I've told God, I believe him now. I don't care if I see, I don't care if God ever answers prayer again for me. I still believe him. I trust him. It doesn't depend on him answering my prayer anymore. I believe he answers prayer, but I don't have to see that to trust him. Glory be to his matchless name. He'll whisper, it doesn't pay to be so holy and sober and pure. No miracles in your life. Why do you bother? You're just like you were. You're just as cold as ever. You're the same old person you always were. Your troubles and problems are piling up on you. Your fasting doesn't get results. Relax! Let me tell you something. That, that's... Let me tell you the three big lies of the devil right now. Number one, don't judge. And be, behind that, the devil can hide behind that smoke screen and do anything he wants to do. Well, we'd better judge righteous judgment. Peter, or Paul judged Peter for being carried away. Jesus judged. Oh, did he judge? He called them vipers and snakes. And we'd better have a holy wrath of God in our hearts. Don't judge. And the other is legalism. Every time, we Brother Raymond have been talking about it. Every time God speaks his word of separation, here comes not the sinners, but the preachers, legalism. You know, I was down at Freddie Garcia's, our drug addict churches down in uh, San Antonio last week. You know, you, you get 600 of those converted drug addicts together and you've got a meeting. And a hundred of them are pastors that are on fire for God. And I was sharing this chapter about getting rid of your television night. I've been listening to all those young preachers get up and preach like a house of fire. And then I looked at their pot bellies and I knew what they're doing. They're sitting for three and four hours in front of TV and junk food and getting fat. And, and, oh, did I lose? Okay. And, uh, so I shared, I gave 31 reasons from the Bible, 31 scriptures why we're to get that abomination out of our house. Set no wicked thing before our eyes. Quit sitting in the seat of the scornful. Thou shalt bring no abomination into thy house. Thou hate it, detest it, lest you become a curse like it. And I'll tell you, the Spirit of the Lord moved. One preacher jumped up and ran, got in his car, ran out and smashed his two TV sets and came back. <laughs> now, in my book, I'm suggesting don't do it in public. Now, we shot 
some 20, we shot $6,000 worth of TV sets here. We shot them with shotguns. And everybody around here laughing about it in the neighborhood, but you know, it's changing now. Nobody laughing because the Lord's beginning to speak about our separation from all that's of the world. So Freddie got up in his church Friday night and he, he told all his preachers, go home. I don't care if you have, to, how far you go, get your sets. We're burning them all. But he called radio and television, all the cameras, something I didn't want to happen. And I picked it, oh, they're going to say, Dave Wilson told us to burn our TV sets and the book will be destroyed before it's out. But you know, the, all the television cameras and everything, it, it looks like they're going to burn over 300 sets before it's all over. And uh, they were, there was the, all the TV and it got on national news and they were smashing those TV sets. But you know, here's, here's the sad thing. The, the press carried it with dignity. And, and there was an awesomeness about it. And those hardened cameramen were saying it's about time. And the sinners were calling up. Their phones were ringing off the wall. Said if we'd have known that, we'd have brought ours. The sinners. But the preachers in town were screaming, legalism! Legalism! Hmm? But Freddie, oh, I had one pastor after another. I'd sit there listening to their fiery sermons. And I have him come up to me later and said, Brother Wilkson, look at this. He said, I got up here and talked about going out winning souls on the street. And I'm sitting three and four hours in front of that thing, losing my soul. I had a young Mexican pastor with me the other day, just pouring out his heart. He said, Brother Wilkson, when I got saved from drugs, I was so on fire, so loving the Lord. He said, just like the rest, I sit down here because I call it relaxation. All idols start with relaxation. That's all they are, the relaxation. They're called diversions. And in this diversion, he said, I've lost everything. My heart went out to him. But you see, this thing, don't judge, and then legalism. And then the third one, and it's worst of all, the worst one. Relax! Relax. You go to California now, the reason I don't go to many churches anymore, the, the drinking is so bad even in Assembly of God churches now. I was talking to Mark, one of our boys here, right front seat here. Mark is a contractor. You know, Mark was telling me in my house last night, when he was hiring people out there, they, they, they said if, if, if you get drunk, you're finished. But the Christian contractors, they, they, they allow drinking and he, they were trying to get him to drink. Not the sinners, but the Christians were trying to get him to drink. The Christians were trying to get him drunk. And, and you go to our Pentecostal churches in the West Coast and many of our big cities, and the, congregate, the eyes in the congregation are full of lust, drinking. And like Mark said, they think it's cool now to curse to curse, to take God's name in vain. You go to a church social now and they talk about their wine list. They talk about their material things. They talk about everything but Jesus. There was a time that we talked about his name. We glorified his name. And I'll tell you, folks, let me show you. Let me take you just a little further on this for just a minute. God, God is going to try, God is going to have to raise up a people who learn to cast all their cares on him. And if you don't learn to cast every care and trust him in everything, you're not going to be ready for what's coming. I want to, I want to find that scripture here for you. Uh, well, anyhow, it's, it, it's, uh, I think it's Jeremiah. He, he said, if, if you run with the footman and they worry you, if you get overheated running with the footman, what are you going to do in the horse race? And he said, if you are weary in a land of peace and security, what are you going to do when the Jordan swells? In other words, you and I are in a race, aren't we? But it's just a foot race. And if you're not trusting God now, in a land of peace and security where all is well and prosperous, what are you going to do when the economy crashes? What are you going to do when judgment begins to fall like a hammer, one after another? And the oil fields in Iran begin to burn, and the bombs are falling on the oil fields. 
And the whole nations and congressmen sit there stunned in silence because they don't know what's happening. And Reagan sits there in his desk turning around his face ashen white and pale because he doesn't know what's happening. The suddenness and the earthquakes begin to come as God's promise. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you can't eat? When you are running in a foot race and you're getting weary and tired and you're not trusting the Lord, how are you going to trust Him when all the apocalyptic horses of Revelation come racing down on this generation? What are you going to do then, he says? If you haven't learned to trust Him now when all is well and peace and calm, and all the day is coming, the day is coming, that God's going to have a people and He's preparing them now while there's still a little time left. He's giving His little space and time to repent if his people to get ready and learn to trust him and cast every care on him and say, I believe, I believe he's going to walk me through the fire. And I can give you five promises that God's going to walk us through the fire. I'm going to take you by the hand and walk you through the fire. I don't know one thing. There's not a prophet in this Bible who thunders the word of God that doesn't preach his grace. And not one that doesn't come with that message of hope for God's overcoming people. And the Lord's going to have an overcoming bride. He's getting it ready. We hear the sound of it all over America now. Preachers who are calling. They call Brother Raven Hill. He's got sometimes 15 a day coming over there. These are hungry men that come and say, like a, a preacher just dropped in here Friday, Joe, 500 miles. And he said, I, 